Good morning, everyone in pre-calculus. So we are at the end game of our semester right now. Uh, and that means that really the only agenda item that I have left for us um, is just to give you some opportunities to refresh your memory on the content of the entire course, uh, as well as iron out some last minute questions about the very last topics that we haven't had as much chance to talk about. So my goal for today's live stream, and I want to do another one of these later on tonight and then maybe also tomorrow morning because your final exam is still out there and you're working on it. Um, is, first of all, to review all 24 topics of our course in 25 minutes. I produced this review video yesterday, um, and what I'd like to do in our live stream is just give you a chance to watch this video one more time, uh, as well as drop questions and flag topics for discussion in our Slack discussion channel while you're looking at it uh, today with us in the live stream. Um, after we're done with that review video, the uh, uh, what I want to do is shift to first of all address any of the questions that came up in the in the Slack channel chat um, during the review. Um, and then move forward from there to look at the solutions of our last three quizzes. Uh, so the quizzes on inverse functions, the introduction to logarithms, and how to solve exponential equations and use exponential models. Um, so we'll look at those solutions to wrap up today's live stream after we're done watching this review video together. So without further ado, um, this is a quick, and I stress the word quick, uh, video that reviews all 24 of our topics in pre-calculus in the span of about 25 minutes. So if you're my current student and you're watching this, these topics should all be old news to you. Um, but it's kind of a, I kind of like this video as a way to gauge, all right, what, which one of these topics do I feel really comfortable about? Which of these topics do I feel like I need some more review? Which of these topics are still feel like they're over my head and I want some discussion on? So while you're watching this, if you're my my current student and watching this live, please do flag any questions that you have or topics that you'd like to see addressed more than others um, by posting into the Slack Ask It channel. And without further ado then, here are 24 topics in about 25 minutes. So what is pre-calculus about? Here's an overview of all 24 of our topics in 24 minutes. In our first topic area, we reviewed key techniques of algebra and we were introduced to our object of study throughout all of the course, functions and their graphs. First, we looked at strategies for simplifying expressions that involve exponents. This included converting radicals into fractional exponents, such as the square root into an exponent of one half. It included distributing powers over multiplication and division. Don't forget that this applies to the numerical coefficients also. Converting division of powers into subtraction of exponents and turning negative exponents into positive by trading multiplication for division to completely simplify an expression involving exponents. Because polynomial and rational expressions play a key role in defining the functions we care about later, we reviewed strategies for factoring and simplifying them. It's usually a good idea to factor rational expressions before doing any arithmetic with them, because here, for example, it helps us to find a common denominator that we need in order to add or subtract our rational expressions. Once that addition or subtraction is all done, the step that you're most likely to screw up in this process is probably the simplification that comes at the very end. Remember, terms that are added or subtracted in the numerator and denominator cannot be reduced or canceled. Only entire factors of the numerator and denominator, such as this x plus 4 up here, can be reduced or canceled. Finding and using formulas for linear relationships is a vital skill for both precalculus and for calculus. If I want to discover, for example, when this green line falls beneath this purple line, we first are going to need to find an equation for the former, and it suffices to find and use its slope along with a single one of its points. The slope of a line is the ratio between differences in y values and corresponding differences in x values. The point slope template then helps us to use that slope along with any known point on the line to determine an equation for that line. If we solve that equation for y, we can then ask when are the green y values beneath less than or equal to the purple y values. This sets up an inequality which we can solve. Remembering to reverse the inequality when we multiply or divide both sides by a negative quantity. We obtain that x is greater than or equal to 8 thirds, which is visible on my x-axis on the graph, and I can express that answer in interval notation that includes a square bracket, which includes 8 thirds in our answer, but does not include infinity because it's not a number. Functions and the ways in which they model relationships among changing quantities are what pre-calculus and calculus are actually all about. 
They're useful because they're deterministic. They relate each one of the inputs in the domain to only one output in their range. For example, because each person in the U.S. has one and only one biological father. The assignment of person to dad is a function, and the domain of that function is the set of all U.S. persons. On this graph, by contrast, there's a single x value that corresponds to more than one y value. This vertical line meets the graph in more than one location. And therefore, this graph fails what we call the vertical line test, and therefore does not depict y as a function of x. The data table in the upper right here has a repeated x value, but since its corresponding y value is the same both times, we can still say that y is a function of x here, and the domain is going to consist of the set of all x values that we can see. Finally, an equation that relates x and y together can be solved for y to determine whether it depicts y as a function of x. In this example, it does because the expression that we obtain is single-valued. The domain of that function, on the other hand, has to exclude the value x equals 0 because that value makes the denominator of this expression 0 and therefore the expression that defines y undefined. So the domain is all real numbers except for x equals 0. The graph of a function depicts all the points in the Cartesian coordinate plane whose y coordinate is equal to f of its x coordinate. While pictures can speak a thousand words, they don't always do so with precision. But we can read the domain of a function off of its graph by squishing the graph onto the x-axis. And we can read the range of a graph by squishing that graph onto the y-axis. We can read the x-intercepts of a graph as the places where that graph crosses the x-axis. In other words, the points at which the y-coordinate is equal to zero. Conversely, the y-intercept of a graph is the point on the graph where the value of x is equal to zero. Given any x value, we can find the value of f of x by reading off the y-coordinate of that graph's corresponding point. And going the other direction, given a value of f of x, in other words, a y-value, we can solve for x by reading off the x-coordinate of the graph's corresponding points. And in these cases, there can, in fact, be more than one. Graph transformations help us to graph complicated functions by beginning from a simpler basic shape. Transformations come in two basic flavors, multiplications, which we want to do first, that can reflect, stretch, or shrink the shape of a graph, and additions and subtractions, which we want to do last, that can shift the graph's location in the coordinate plane. Applying these operations to the y variable outside of the expression that defines the function has a vertical effect on the graph, while applying them directly to the x variable has a horizontal effect. But remember that the x effects can be counterintuitive. For example, replacing x with x plus 5 has the effect of shifting the graph to the left by 5 units, because what we're really doing is shifting the x-axis to the right. The simplest function type that we study models relationships where addition and subtraction in one variable results in addition or subtraction in the other. These are called the linear functions, and the constant ratio between those changes is called their slope. The slope and intercept of a linear model are more than mere numbers. In context, they are meaningful descriptions of a relationship. Given two points, there is a unique linear function that includes them both, for which we can find a formula, again, by first determining the slope. And then, for example, we can use the slope-intercept template, y equals mx plus b, to determine a formula using a known point to determine the y-intercept. The slope can be interpreted in context by restoring the units of x and y back into the fraction that defines it. In this example, the units are dollars per thousand sales. And the slope's meaning says that an increase of 1 in the x variable, here selling a thousand more pairs of shoes, is going to correspond to a decrease of 0.2 in y, in other words, decreasing the price per pair by 20 cents. As always, the y-intercept of this relationship is the value of y when x is equal to 0, which in context here tells us that zero pairs of shoes will sell if the price of shoes is set at $120 a piece. Did you know you can have a conversation with a function? If you tell it a value for x, it can tell you a corresponding value for y, and if you're lucky, the reverse is also true. The formula for this linear model from the previous example permits us both to specify an x value, 200,000 pairs of shoes sold, and ask for its y value, the price. 
And we can also specify a y value, in this example a price of zero, and ask for its x value, the number of sales. For the former, we need only to evaluate f of 200, which comes out using our formula to 80. For the latter, we need to solve the equation f of x is equal to zero, which in this example is not so difficult because this is just a linear equation to solve. Notice that since y was equal to zero, what we're really talking about here is the x-intercept of this graph. When we place this back into context, never forget to re-include your units when placing your answers into a real-world situation. In this example, $80 per pair was this price, and 600,000 pairs was this quantity. Now, the real world is rarely as simple as a linear function, but often it gets close. A linear regression is a way to discover which linear equation matches a set of data points better than any other linear equation does. We can use technology to find a slope-intercept equation for this line of best fit, as well as its correlation coefficient r, whose sign tells you the direction of the correlation. Here, fairway accuracy for golfers decreases as their average drive distance increases. And the magnitude of that correlation coefficient tells us the strength of the correlation. Here, this number is pretty far away from 1, and so this is not a terrific linear model for this data. Because this equation captures an overall trend, we can also use it to make general statements about the data by, for example, interpreting its slope, or making specific predictions about new data points by evaluating or solving this equation for a given x value or for a given y value. The next level after linear functions are quadratic functions, which can model behavior that has a maximum or a minimum point. Quadratic functions can have as many as two x-intercepts, and how many they have is determined by the sign of the discriminant b squared minus 4ac. Finding the x-intercepts themselves, on the other hand, is a matter of solving a quadratic equation, which in the best of times is a factoring problem each of those factors matching one of our x-intercepts. That's going to become a recurring theme for us. As always, the y-intercept is the value f of zero. Graphs of quadratic functions, called parabolas, are symmetric across a vertical axis whose x-coordinate can be found by dividing minus b by 2a. The vertex, the maximum or minimum point of the parabola, can be found at this x-value. And we can find the y value of that point by evaluating our function at that x value. Since every parabola is a graph transformation of the basic shape y equals x squared, that means that this vertex also tells us the horizontal and vertical shifts that are necessary to create this parabola from graph transformations, and the leading coefficient a tells us the vertical stretch. To optimize a quantity, is to determine where it reaches its maximum or its minimum value. In general, we need calculus to carry this out, but for quadratic functions, we only need to find its vertex. Respectively, a parabola that has a negative leading coefficient is going to reach its maximum value at its vertex, and a parabola with a positive leading coefficient attains a minimum value at its vertex. In this example, we can find how to maximize sales revenue simply by finding the x-coordinate of the vertex in the usual way, minus b over 2a. This gives the number of pairs of sneakers in thousands that we have to sell in order to achieve that maximum. And the y-coordinate of that vertex gives us the amount of sales revenue that's attained at that maximum. As always, when we place this information back into a context, don't forget to include the units. When 300,000 pairs are sold, $33,300,000 of revenue is generated. To solve a quadratic equation is a well-worn algebra skill, but what about an inequality? By rearranging a quadratic inequality so that it has a zero on one side, we can reduce it to the question, how does the sign of this quadratic expression depend on the value of x? And the best way to understand the answer to that question is to find the factors of that expression. Because after all, if we know whether each of these factors is negative or positive, we will know how they multiply together to determine whether the whole expression is negative or positive. We can use a sign chart to keep track of this information by first finding where each of my factors becomes zero, and then listing the sign of each one of those factors on either side of the x value at which it becomes zero. Multiplying those signs together is going to give me the sign of the whole quadratic expression, and since in this example our inequality is satisfied when that expression is positive or zero, we keep only those pieces of the number line at which this expression is positive or zero. 
we then can express our answer in interval notation as the union of those two corresponding closed intervals. Quadratic functions introduce us to the role that leading coefficients play in governing which direction the graph points, opening upward or downward. That's called end behavior. They also showed the role of factors in determining the nature of the zeros of polynomial functions, called local behavior. So what if we have more than just two factors? And what if we can not only multiply by those factors, but divide by them as well? The higher degree polynomials and the rational functions that we can study are going to look more complicated, but much of the story remains the same as it did for quadratics. A polynomial function is defined to be a sum of multiples of whole powers of x, the highest power of which is called the degree of that polynomial. That degree is found in the leading term, and that leading term governs the polynomial's end behavior. Even degree polynomials originate and terminate in the same infinite direction, whether positive or negative while odd degrees originate in one and terminate in the other. The sign of the leading coefficient then tells us which end is up on the right side of the graph, as x tends to positive infinity. While the y-intercept, as always, is a simple matter of evaluating f of 0, finding the x-intercepts, or the zeros, of a polynomial is much more challenging, and it's best done by placing the polynomial into its factored form. Just as with quadratics, each one of those factors gives rise to a zero of our function. When those factors are repeated more than once, we say that their exponent is the multiplicity of that zero. Those multiplicities tell us the function's local behavior, the shape of its graph, near each of those zeros. Taken together with the end behavior, this helps us to sketch the entire graph of the polynomial function. In addition to end behavior and local behavior near zeros, the number of turning points the local maximum and minimum values, analogous to the vertex of a parabola, can also give us important information about a polynomial function. The fundamental theorem of algebra guarantees that a polynomial cannot have any more real zeros than its degree, and also that it cannot have any more turning points than one less than its degree. When I combine those two pieces of information with the end behavior that gives you the sign and the degree, and the zeros that give me which factors that we want, we're going to have enough information to be able to predict a formula for a custom polynomial that has all of the features on its graph that we're looking for, made to measure. The only thing we need to do at the end of this process is adjust our leading coefficient so that we get exactly the y-intercept the y -intercept that we desire. When it comes to polynomials, where there are zeros, there are factors. And this relationship is so tight that we can use any known zero of a polynomial function to predict one of its factors. And from there, Polynomial division is a strategy that can help us to determine the quotient and continue to factor. This process of dividing to find the cofactor can, in principle, continually be repeated until my polynomial is completely factored. And once it's completely factored, we have therefore found all of its zeros. What's more, polynomial division also has the ability to evaluate a polynomial function. To evaluate f at a given value, x equals a, just divide f by x minus a and take the remainder. When we find that remainder, that remainder is exactly the value of f at a. And in some cases, this can be faster than just plugging in that x value in the first place. A rational function is nothing more than the result of dividing two polynomials. The zeros of the polynomial in the numerator predict the possible x-intercepts that that function can have. But the real action happens in the denominator, whose zeros are going to make the function's value undefined. The zeros of the denominator are therefore the excluded values of the domain of the function. And notice that this remains true even when one of the factors in the denominator might happen to reduce completely with a factor in the numerator, such as these x minus 2s canceling out. Even after simplifying, that value still needs to be excluded from the domain. Just as with polynomial functions, the end behavior of rational functions is governed by leading terms. Only now, it's the combination of the leading terms of the numerator and the denominator. When their quotient is a non-zero constant, as it is here, that constant gives us the function's horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the denominator happens to exceed the degree of the numerator, then that horizontal asymptote is always y equals 0, in other words, the x-axis. When the degree in the numerator is higher than the denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote at all. But when that degree is exactly 1 higher than the degree of the denominator, we get a slant asymptote whose equation can be found through polynomial division. 
Meanwhile, by factoring my rational function completely, we'll be able to determine the local behavior of the function near the excluded values in its domain. A denominator factor that reduces completely corresponds to a removable discontinuity, or a hole in the graph where that factor becomes zero. A denominator factor that does not reduce completely corresponds to a vertical asymptote where that factor becomes zero. And a numerator factor that does not reduce gives us an x-intercept. Now near any vertical asymptote, we can make a sign chart of all the expression's factors and then use that sign chart to classify the function's local behavior near that asymptote, whether it goes to positive infinity or negative infinity on each of the left side and the right side of that vertical asymptotes can be determined by a sign chart. Putting it all together, we have a strategy for customizing a rational function whose graph has whatever properties that we desire. To create an x-intercept, for example, we'll place a factor in the numerator that vanishes at the desired value of x. If we do the same in the denominator, we can create vertical asymptotes. By repeating those factors, we can change the local behavior, repeating an even number of times to make the local behavior match on either side of the asymptote, and an odd number of times to make the local behaviors opposite on either side of the asymptote. We can create a removable discontinuity, or a hole, by placing that factor in both the numerator and the denominator. And finally, as with our polynomial example, we can adjust the leading coefficient as well as the degree of the numerator and the denominator until the end behavior and or the y-intercept that we want are exactly right. In this example, all we need to do is make a leading coefficient negative so that f of negative 1 can end up being a negative value. The last function models we study are those with the power to correlate addition and subtraction in one variable with multiplication or division in the other. These are the exponential and logarithmic functions, each of which is inverse to the other. By inverse function, we mean a pair of functions, each of which exactly undoes what the original function does. That is, each of them represents the very same relation, only the roles of x and y, input and output, have been reversed. Despite the confusing notation, inverse functions are generally not the same thing as reciprocals. Inverses are defined using the notion of a composite function, where the output of one function is fed into the input of another. Composite functions can be evaluated just by following the order of operations. If a function has an inverse, then when it's composed with its inverse, the result is the so-called identity function, whose output is equal to its input, the inverse having undone exactly what the original function did. Finding a formula for an inverse function is simply a matter of reversing the roles of x and y, and then trying to solve the resulting equation. If we can do that, the result is going to give us a formula for the inverse function. Thinking graphically, the inverse of a relation, any relation, reflects the original across the diagonal line y equals x, interchanging vertical with horizontal. But in order for this inverse function to be a function and pass the vertical line test, the original function has to therefore have passed the horizontal line test. A function which does is called invertible or one-to-one. -one. In this example, we're looking at a function that did not pass the horizontal line test, so was not one-to-one, -one, and so its inverse is not a function. An exponential function is one in which addition and subtraction in its input variable is correlated with multiplication or division in its output. When y is an exponential function of x, every increase of 1 in x gives rise to a multiplication in y by a factor of a constant b called the base of the function. This quantity is the exponential function's analog to slope. As with linear equations, there's an equation form for exponential functions that directly uses both the base and the y-intercept. But the base is frequently rewritten as a power of the natural number e, however and we can find this coefficient r, sometimes called the rate constant, by using a logarithm with a base of e called a natural logarithm. Now, indeed, the very definition of a logarithm is that it is inverse to the exponential function. In other words, the base b log exactly undoes what a base b exponential does, reversing the roles of input and output. That definition permits me to rewrite any exponential expression or equation in a logarithmic form, and vice versa. For straightforward examples like these, that rewriting and a little bit of light guessing and checking is enough to evaluate these expressions and solve these equations without the use of a calculator. But when a calculator's logarithm buttons are necessary, the LOG button gives us a log with a base of 10, and the LN button gives us a log with a base that's equal to the natural number E.
Because logs convey the same relationship that exponents do, only in reverse, every power and exponent property in algebra has a corresponding logarithm property. For example, powers inside of a log are multiples on the outside of a log. Division on the inside turns into subtraction on the outside. And a, a multiplication on the inside of a log turns into addition on the outside. On the other hand, addition or subtraction inside of a log cannot be simplified any further. These properties can be used both to expand a bunch of arithmetic that happens inside of a log, or to collect a bunch of arithmetic that happens on the outside, provided the bases of all of our logs match. Speaking of matching bases, an exponential equation with a common base on both sides can be solved simply by equating the exponents, since all exponential functions are one-to-one. -one. This remains true if we can rewrite one exponential in an obvious way so as to make the bases match. This is the same as taking a logarithm on both sides. But when there's no obvious way to match the bases, any logarithm will do to rescue the variables from out of the exponents and through the properties of logarithms make a solution possible. Finally, the change of base formula lets us evaluate a numerical logarithm such as the base 2 log of 3 whose base is unknown to our calculators by choosing any base that we like and dividing the log of our quantity by the log of our custom base. Again, the properties of logarithms helping us to solve these equations that otherwise would not be possible to gather together. Always check your answers when you solve a logarithmic or exponential equation because sometimes solutions pop up that are spurious. Finally, we can have conversations with exponential functions by supplying a value for x and asking for y or vice versa. When I supply a value for x and ask for y, I need only to do some arithmetic following the order of operations to discover that value. But when I supply a y and ask for x, we need to solve for this x in the exponent by first doing all of the algebra necessary to unwrap that power and get the power by itself. Only then can we then take a logarithm with the base that we need in order to rescue the x variable and finish the solution using the change of base formula or a calculator where necessary. We can also bring back their interpretation of the base of my exponential equation as being the factor by which y is multiplied when x is increased by 1. Keep in mind also that percents are often used as a way of communicating about multiplicative changes rather than multiplicative factors. And that's all there is to our pre-calculus course. With this inside and out understanding of these six types of function models and how they represent different relationships between changing quantities, you're going to be equipped to tackle calculus next semester, where you're going to study ways of taking any function apart into its infinitesimally small differential rates of change and then integrating those changes back together to recover a function from them. After pre-calculus, you'll be all set to go. So what is pre-calculus? So welcome back uh, from our viewing of the 24 in 25, 24 topics, 25 minutes, what is pre-calculus? I hope it was helpful. Um, that video is up in our, uh, in our stream for our course on our Canvas site, as well as as part of the YouTube channel for this course. So feel free to revisit that anytime you want to. You can use YouTube's controls to slow it down, pause it. Um, I try to make it comprehensive without giving so much detail that it takes forever <laughs> to go through the entire course. So um, we didn't get any questions uh, dropped into the Slack channel from current students during that viewing. So we're going to go straight forward uh, into talking about the solutions to our last three quizzes, um, where I'm not going to be able to really do justice to all of them. Um, but I kind of want to hit the, the high points uh, and look at maybe some of the places on these quizzes that were maybe the most challenging uh, and will help us most to sort of underscore uh, what are the important uh, ideas and concepts that are in these last three topics for the semester. So we'll start out on quiz 10, and quiz 10 had a dual purpose. Uh, the first of which was to, um, was to introduce us to composite and inverse functions in sort of the abstract. So how do we think about what it means for two functions to be inverses to one another um, from a graphical perspective, from a numerical perspective, and from an algebraic perspective. And then the second goal on quiz number 10 is to get an introduction to the basics of how exponential functions work, how they relate addition and subtraction in their input quantity to multiplication or division in their output quantity. So the first side of this quiz um, asks you to do some work with composite and inverse functions. So it begins 
by giving you these graphs, a graph of a function f over here on the left, a graph of a function g over here on the right, and just asking you to evaluate some values. So I start out real basic doing something we could have done much earlier in the semester, which is what is f of 1? Well, f of 1 is asking for the y value on this graph that corresponds to the x value of 1. So to find that, we would just go to 1 on the x-axis, find the corresponding point on the graph of f, and read off its y-coordinate. That's why f of 1 is equal to 3. But skipping across to part D over here, part D is asking for f inverse of 0. Now remember, according to the review video that we just watched together, asking for the inverse function's value, or asking for the inverse, sometimes called the pre-image of a value, is the same as treating this value like a y and that value like an x. That is what inverse functions do. They reverse the roles of x and y in the very same relationship between those two quantities. So if you want to know what f inverse of 0 is, treat the 0 like it's a y in my original function and figure out what is the x. And so what that means is I'm going to find on the graph of f the y value, 0, and ask what x value corresponds to that y value. So I'll look to the left, I'll look to the right, and I find out that the x value that corresponds to a y value of 0 is the x value of 2. Another way to think about this is that the point 2, 0 lies on the graph of my original function. And it lies on the graph of my original function exactly because f of 2 is equal to 0. But if we were to graph the inverse of this function, then the inverse of this function would tell me that f inverse of 0 is equal to 2. Again, because the roles of x and y are being reversed. But the relationship remains the same. So f of 2 is equal to 0 exactly because the inverse of 0 is equal to 2. Just reverse the roles. And where this starts to get a little bit more interesting is a question like part h here, which actually most of you this semester um, didn't get this part right. Uh, and it's a little bit subtle, so let's talk about this. So we're asking for g inverse of 0. It's the very same question as we asked for f inverse of 0, except we're using this function who's graphed here instead. So the question is, if y is equal to 0 on this graph, what is x? And so we come into the graph, and we go to y equals 0, which is the x-axis, and we look to the left, and we look to the right, and we find out that there's actually three places on this graph that have a y-coordinate of 0. And it looks like about 3.4 is one of them, uh, 0 is another one of them, and then negative 3.4 looks like it's the other one. That's an approximation. Again, a picture speaks a thousand words, but not very accurately. So. Given that there are these three different points on the graph that have a y value of 0, why am I claiming that the inverse function, g inverse of 0, doesn't exist? For the simple reason that when you use this notation, g inverse of 0, implicitly that notation is looking for g inverse as a function. If g has an inverse function, then what is its inverse function applied to the value 0? The problem is, g inverse cannot be a function, because g inverse of 0 would have to have all three of the different values, negative 3.4, 0, and 3.4. And since a function cannot have more than one output value for any given input, that means that g inverse of 0 does not exist as a function value. So one way that we can kind of head that off at the pass is just by noticing that this graph of g absolutely does not pass the horizontal line test. In other words, we would say that g is not a one-to-one -one function. Or another way to say that is that g is not an invertible function. Right? It fails the horizontal line test. And since g fails the horizontal line test, g inverse is not a function. There is no function which undoes what g does. And that's why we say that g inverse of 0 doesn't exist. So that's the graphical perspective on how to get values for inverse functions into and out of a graph. Um, the other goal here in this problem was also to talk about the values of composite functions like g of f of 1. And just real quickly before we move off of this problem, um, let's take a look at that value real quick.
if I'm trying to evaluate g of f of 1, according to the order of operations, the first thing I'm trying to do here is evaluate the value on the inside, that f of 1 that's sitting right there. So I find f of 1, which we actually did here in this problem, f of 1 was equal to 3. And so according to the order of operations, g of f of 1 is just another name for g of 3, according to, again, this answer f of 1 is equal to 3. And so then I just go over to my graph, take g of 3. g of 3 is eh, approximately negative 9. Again, I'm kind of reading this graph as best I can visually. We don't know how accurate it's going to be. So we can then move forward to the question of how do we find formulas for in composite and inverse functions in generality. So for composite functions, it's just a matter of taking the output of one function and feeding it into the inverse of, or into the input rather, of the other. And the one place to be really careful when finding formulas for composite functions is that, uh, where people sometimes get screwed up, is that the x that we use to define our original functions is really a placeholder for whatever input that we're giving to those functions. So for example, when I look at f circle g, which is another name for f of g of x, what I'm really trying to do here is I'm trying to take the output of the g function and make it the input of my f function. But when I go and look at the formula that defines my function f, f of x is 1 over 1 minus x. That just means that f of whatever we give it as its input is 1 over 1 minus that whatever. So sometimes I like to come in here and just replace x with something like a, a brown dot or something. Just to remind myself that really the role that that x is playing is it's just a placeholder. It's a place for me to put an input. So f of g of x, if I put a g of x in place of this brown dot right here, which is what we're trying to do, right, then we know that f of that g of x is going to be 1 over 1 minus that g of x. That's just a wrinkle in how we use notation to represent functions, the x as a placeholder, not as a definite quantity. And now that I've written it this way, now I can kind of see what to do. In place of my g of x, I'm going to write x squared minus 1. And this is another place where a few people drop the ball a little bit on this problem. Because when we're subtracting g of x, we need to be subtracting all of g of x. Put it in a set of parentheses there when you do that subtraction. Because now, if I'm going to simplify, I need to subtract all of g of x, which in, uh, involves subtracting the x squared, but also subtracting negative 1. I distribute out that subtraction, 1 minus x squared plus 1. And that's where I get the final answer that I had here, 1 over 2 minus x squared. I did advise you in this problem that you don't have to simplify completely. but uh, and so I would accept this answer sitting right here. But if you didn't have the parentheses, then that answer wouldn't be quite right anyway. Right? We would have that, that little sign error plaguing us. So that's how to co build composite functions from an algebraic perspective. In our third problem, behind my head here, how do I take this function, the same as the f function that we had in the last problem, and how do we use algebra to find a formula for its inverse function? Not its composite function, but its inverse function. And so just as we saw in the review video, the entire role, the entire job of an inverse function is to uh, reverse the roles of input and output. So if the job of f is to transform x into 1 over 1 minus x, which now we're going to call y. Right? So if y is equal to 1 over 1 minus x, then it's the job of the inverse function to do the opposite. So one way to think about this is whatever my inverse function is, it should have the property that when I feed that inverse function 1 over 1 minus x, the output from that inverse function should be x again. I've reversed the roles of x and y. And so to find a formula for that inverse function, I'm just going to reverse the place of the y and the place of the x in this equation and find out that what I'm trying to do is come up with a relation that turns x into y, where x is equal to 1 over 1 minus y. So I've done that, that transposition that an inverse function is by definition. And so now I just need to solve this equation for y, which I would do by multiplying both sides by 1 minus y. 1 minus y times x is equal to 1. Using the distributive property to multiply that out and get x minus xy is equal to 1.
I'm trying to get the y by itself, so I'm going to subtract x from both sides. Then I'm going to divide by minus x. Uh, and oops, you can't quite see my writing off the bottom of the screen there. Uh, let me actually just make that adjustment real quick. There we go. OK. Um, and there then is a formula for my inverse function. Um, compare that to my final answer just by multiplying the top and bottom, the numerator and denominator of this rational function by negative 1. We get x minus 1 over x. So the key step here is the replacement of x by y and vice versa. Um, then after that, all the algebra that we do is just kind of icing on the cake. So that's the first half of this quiz, dealing with composite and inverse functions. On the second half, we get our introduction to exponential functions and what it means for a function to be displaying exponential behavior. It was the case that most of you were able to get question four right, but a lot of you sort of dropped the ball on question five. Uh, so let's take a look at both of these in succession because they kind of feed off of one another. Question four gives you two sets of three data points and asks which one of these is depicting an exponential function and which one is not. And it's the case that the second data set the points p, q, and r represent an exponential function. We can tell because the relationships between the x variables in my data set are given by addition. If I add 1 to negative 1, I get 0. If I add 1 to 0, I get 1. And so in the x direction, we're seeing very clearly that there are changes that are additions, right? Addition by 1. What's happening in the y variables? Well, we can tell in our y variables, y is going here from 1 to 2, and then from 2 to 4, that the best way to describe those changes is using multiplication. Multiplication by 2 and multiplication by 2. And if those are the changes that are happening in y, then, to me at least, it jumps right off the page that what's happening here is that an addition in x is correlating with the same multiplication in y each time that we see it. Every time we add 1 to x, we multiply y by 2. That makes this an exponential function, and it makes 2 the base of this exponential function. If we were to look at the data set over here on the right, what's happening in the x variable is still the same. right? We're adding 1 to x to get from the first point to the second. We're adding 1 again to get from the second point to the third point. But in the y variable, the change from 1 to 2 to 3 cannot be described as a consistent multiplication but instead is a consistent addition. And so in this case, what we have is not an exponential function, but a linear function. And the slope of this linear function would be the ratio of plus 1 divided by plus 1, so it would have a slope of 1. Just write that here, just to remind ourselves of what the picture would look like if we were having a linear function discussion instead of an exponential function discussion. But the exponential function is in this data set. So why was the second problem here so much more challenging? I'm just going to scoot my page up here a little bit. Well, it was more challenging because we no longer had a consistent relationship between my x variables. Right? In our first example, our x values were all separated by the same 1. Right? Down here, my first pair of x values is separated by 2, and my second pair is separated by 1. So we have a little bit more interesting question. And it was that that I knew was going to screw people up, and that's why I asked the question in this way, mea culpa. I wanted to see sort of how you were thinking about exponentials um, from a point of view of uh, changes in the variables x and y. So let me write this a little bit bigger. x values that we have that we know for sure are negative 2, 0, and 1. So I'm going to write down a data table here that gives me some room to write an additional point. 18, 54. So there are all of the x and y values that we know at this point, right? And if our suspicion is that this is exponential, then what we would want to do is we would want to try the same thing that we tried up here, which is let's denote the changes in my uh, x variables using addition and subtraction. So the change between this 0 and this 1 you can think of as plus 1. And the changes in my y variables I want to think of as multiplication. And so the question is, by how much do we have to multiply 18 to get 54? And that missing factor problem is solved by 80, uh, 54 divided by 18, or 3. 
So if this data set really does represent an exponential function, we're going to expect that the base of that exponential function is the factor by which y is multiplied when x is increased by 1. That factor looks to be 3. So then the question is, does this data point, negative 2, 2, follow that same pattern? The problem, of course, is that negative 2 is separated from its nearest data point here of 0, not by plus 1, but by plus 2. And so then the question is, what's going to happen in the y variable if this really is an exponential function? What should we be multiplying y by in the case when we're adding 2 to x rather than adding 1 to x? Let's assume for the moment that this is an exponential function with a base of 3, as this second and third data point would seem to suggest. Then adding 2 to x is really the same thing as adding 1 to x twice. This is the key insight, that if you had this insight, then you probably navigated this question correctly. Adding 2 to x is the same as adding 1 twice. And so if I add 1 twice in an exponential function to x, then that means to the y variable, I should be doing this change, multiplication by 3, twice. Each time I add 1 to x, I multiply y by 3. And so we would expect we're multiplying by 3 once and then multiplying by 3 again. Let's check and see if this actually is borne out in the data. If I start from the y value of 2 and multiply it by 3 once, then the intermediate x value, or y value, that I'm going to get here is 6, 2 times 3. And then when I add 1 to x one more time, I'm going to multiply y by 3 one more time. 6 times 3 is 18. And sure enough, that exactly works out. This data point, negative 1, 6, bridges the gap that's present in my data set between x equals negative 2 and x equals 0, y equals 2 and y equals 18. And so since that worked out exactly the way that we needed it to, that confirms for us that this data set represents an exponential function with a base of 3. Compare that to the data set that's over here. right? Over here, we have times 3 times 3 happening twice in the y variable, but my x variable is going plus 2 plus 1. So the same multiplicative change in y is correlating to two different additive changes in x, which is why this data set does not represent an exponential function. So number five is probably the trickiest problem on this quiz. And so if you had some difficulty with it, you were definitely not alone. It was written that way. The last couple of questions dealt with a graph and then an algebraic use of an exponential model. Um, number seven, people tended not to have too much trouble with. So let's talk about that one real quickly. We just wanted to know, based on this model of depreciation for a 2015 Cadillac Escalade ESV that was purchased for 85,000, but then uh, its value falls to f of t given by this function after t years, we want to know what's the dollar value of this vehicle today in the year 2019. And so, almost invariably, people successfully noticed that saying the year 2019 is really because x here is measured in the number of years, sorry, t is measured in the number of years since 2015. 2019 should be a value of t equals 4. And if I know a value for t and I want to find a value for f of t, then that's going to be a simple matter of plugging in a 4 for t in my function. So f of 4 is going to answer this question. And from there, we just have to do an order of operations calculation. And that calculation leads us to 40.427, which, when we place back into context the units of our, uh, our f of t function, f of t is the vehicle's value in thousands of dollars, that is how we get from 40.427 to the actual contextual answer to this problem. So let's talk about question six real quick, um, because this one was definitely also tricky uh, for some people. So in this problem, we want to know an equation for this graph of a transformed exponential function. Now, we're going to put our graph transformation hats back on and think, what is the basic shape that we would have been starting with uh, for this exponential graph? So this required us, really, to know what the graph of the original exponential function, f of x equals e to the x, looks like. And that graph looks like this. <laughs> 
it has uh, an important point on the y-intercept here at 0, 1. And it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, in other words, on the x-axis. And those are really the two features that are the most important for us in figuring out how to do the transformation that we need to do here. I've kind of given away, because this would have otherwise been really tricky to read off the graph in the problem, that our graph that we're trying to get to has been horizontally compressed by a factor of 2. So that's something that we want to kind of fix that right away. I'm going to list my transformation steps over here on the left. I want to horizontally compress by a factor of 2. And that's going to give me uh, the equation f of x equals e to the 2x. Right? To horizontally compress a graph, I want to multiply its, replace x by twice its uh, original value. Right? That's going to squish the graph in towards the y-axis by a factor of 2. Um, and then, now that I've done that, I need to come up with a graph that instead of being an increasing function, we want our graph to be a decreasing function. So before I do any shifting, I want to finish all of my reflecting by doing a vertical reflection. And a vertical reflection is going to replace y by minus y, minus e to the 2x. And that minus e to the 2x um, is going to give me a graph that now does this instead. right? It's going to be decreasing instead of increasing like my original graph was. And actually, let me try and get this as accurate as I can. So minus e to the 2x is going to look like this. And its y-intercept is still going to be here at negative 1. So y equals minus e to the 2x. It's going to look like that. So now I want to try doing a shift. Because the horizontal asymptote of y equals e to the minus e to the 2x is still on the x-axis, y equals 0. And I want to move it up to the horizontal asymptote that this graph has. This horizontal asymptote appears to be at the line y equals 5. So if I want my horizontal asymptote to do that, I need to shift my graph up by 5 units. Up by 5 units. And so to do that, that's where my plus 5 is going to come from. And the only problem that we have now, when I shift this graph up by 5 units, let me declutter the graph that I have over here, y equals minus e to the 2x plus 5 is going to have the right horizontal asymptote, but it's not going to have the right y-intercept anymore. Because for this function, f of 0 is minus e to the 0 plus 5. e to the 0 is equal to 1. And so the y-intercept of this graph is not 0, 2, but it's at 0, 4. And so what this tells me is that I really have one more thing that I need to fix before we go and, and call this problem done. I want to make my y-intercept 0, 2 instead of 0, 4. And to do that, um, I'm just going to uh, introduce a vertical stretch over here in addition to my vertical reflection. So if I introduce a vertical stretch, I don't know what the stretch is that I need, so I'm going to call it a for a minute, minus a e to the 2x. And now that I have that a in here, I can make my y-intercept be whatever I want it to be. Because f of 0 minus a times e to the 0 plus 5. e to the 0 is equal to 1, and so I'm going to get negative a plus 5, or 5 minus a. And if I want that y-intercept to be 2 instead of 4, now I can just set that equal to 2 and figure out that the value of a that I need here is 3. So that's where this 3 comes from in my final answer. Right? Minus 3 e to the 2x plus 5. That has all the features that we want that graph to have. So that was a little bit longer of an explanation than I was hoping for for quiz uh, number 10, but I hope that it was helpful. We're going to move forward onto the second quiz, quiz 11, and I'm going to try to be a little bit more uh, efficient with our time in talking about this uh, next quiz that's coming up here.
So quiz 11 gives us our introduction to the conversion between exponential and logarithmic form uh, for uh, exponential and logarithmic equations, as well as um, an introduction to the properties of logarithms that can help us to rewrite logs in different forms by taking the arithmetic that's happening on the inside of the log and transporting it to arithmetic that happens on the outside of the log, or vice versa. So the key observation, I'm going to keep harping on this um, because this really is the most important thing to know about um, most important thing to know about exponential and logarithmic functions in the first place is what is the translation back and forth from exponential to logarithmic form. And that again is this old conversion. Any exponential expression or exponential function b to the x equals y can be converted into a logarithmic equation instead, just by reversing the roles of x and y. So again, take a look at what's happening with the y and the x here. They're trading places, right? y is solved for here, x is solved for there. And when I trade places between x and y, that function which defines the expression on the left-hand side is replaced by its inverse function. So the base b exponential has as an inverse function the base b logarithm. Right? And that rearrangement is the key to everything that we do with solving exponential equations and understanding what logarithms are in the first place. And so that's why I really wanted to groove that into your brain in the first problem on this quiz. Just take each of the exponential equations that we had here and rewrite it as a log. Trade places between the right-hand side and the exponent and replace the exponential with a log. The 8 goes over to the right, the 256 goes over to the left, and the exponential with a base of 2 becomes a logarithm with a base of 2. And that same do-si-do -do, uh, explains the answers for all of, the, all of the questions on this first page of the quiz. It also explains how to carry out the calculations in these next set of problems. So for example, if I were to ask you, as I did here, what is the base 10 log of 100,000? Let's take a look at this one for just a moment. If I ask you what the base 10 log of 100,000 is, it's equal to x, then the way to understand this expression on the left-hand side is to convert into exponential form. So we started here with a logarithmic uh, equation. So to understand a logarithm, what we want to do is just convert it back into its equivalent exponential form. So I'm going to trade places between this 100,000 and this x. And when I trade places, the logarithm function is replaced by its inverse function. Right, so we're going to trade places here. The x is going to end up on the left-hand side. My 100,000 is going to end up on the right-hand side of the equation. And instead of a base 10 log, we're going to get an exponential with a base of 10. That's the key to understanding how logarithms work. And so the real question that's being asked here is how many powers of 10 are necessary to make the number 100,000? Um, and I actually have an error in my answer key. I just caught that right now. So here's another good reason why I should do this kind of thing more often. <laughs> because how many powers of 10 does it take to make 100,000? It takes 5 powers of 10. 10 to the 5 is equal to 100,000. My answer key had said 6, but 10 to the 6th power is 1 million, not 100,000. So mea culpa. Um, we actually want 5 as the answer to this problem, not 6. Uh, if you're my current student, don't worry, I graded the quizzes correctly. Uh, I just had the, uh, the, the solution written incorrectly in our solution set. So um, that translation between exponential and logarithmic form is absolutely the key to understanding what logarithms are uh, and to solving uh, any kind of exponential or logarithmic equation. Problem five here is very much like the problem from the previous quiz, uh, where we have to speculate on a formula for this graph, um, starting with a basic shape. So I just want to kind of give a quick recap of how we might think about this problem. The basic shape that we might be thinking of here for a logarithm function has a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. In other words, the vertical line, x equals 0. And so, um, if I want to, first of all, get a graph that looks like this red curve right here, the first thing I notice is that I want my logarithm graph to, instead of going upwards to the right, I want it to go upwards to the left. So the first thing I would do, if I consider this to be y equals some log, and I want to talk about the base here in a minute, 
But if I start with just a generic log of x, um, then the first thing I might do is apply that horizontal reflection. And I do that by replacing x by minus x. And if I were to do that, then I would have a log graph. Oops, let me again try to be as accurate as I can. I would have a log graph that opens up to the left instead of opening up to the right. Its vertical asymptote, however, would still be at x equals 0. And so to get it to where I want it to go, I'm going to want to shift this graph to the right by two units. So shift right by 2. And to shift right by 2, I just have to replace x by the quantity x minus 2. Remember that reverse psychology. And now I'm going to have my log graph with its asymptote where I want it. It's going to pass through 1, 0. But the problem we're going to have is that it might not pass through negative 2, 1 uh, the way that we want it to. And so that's why I've left the base of my logarithm uh, undetermined at this point, because we're actually going to fix that right here at the end. And we're going to fix it by going back to the very definition of exponential and logarithmic behavior in the first place. When we go back to that definition, remember that a logarithmic function is one in which multiplication in the x direction is correlated with addition in the y direction. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to shift. I'm going to translate um, this logarithmic graph back to its untranslated form, because this is going to make uh, our life a lot easier here in a moment. And in its untranslated form, Remember that going from y equals 0 to y equals 1 on our graph, so y equals 0 to y equals 1, we can interpret that for a logarithmic function as a, an increase in the y direction of plus 1. And the base of my logarithmic function is an answer to the question, how much are we multiplying by? in the x direction when we're increasing the y direction by 1. It's exactly the opposite of when we ask the question about the base of an exponential function, because logarithms are the inverse functions for exponentials. And so the roles of input and output, x and y, are exactly the opposite. So I guess the question that we need to be asking here is, once I've done my shift by 2, right, this point here on the axis, which is now negative 1, 0, right, moves over to 1, 0. And the point negative 2, 1 is going to have originated at negative 4, 1. And so the base of the logarithm that I need is the factor, the missing factor in the question, negative 1 times what is equal to negative 4. And that's how I discover that the base of the logarithm that I really wanted in this problem is a base of 4. And that concludes this graph question. All right, let's move on to the algebraic properties. Uh, and there's a lot to unpack here, so I just want to look at a couple of the more intricate uh, examples. Um, let's actually, the one that I'm most interested in here uh, is this part C. In part C, I'm just going to sort of slide this around a little bit so we can see better. We're taking a base 10 logarithm of this whole expression here on the inside. And just like in our example from the review video, um, we can take this radical, rewrite it as a 1 half exponent. Get used to doing that, because in your calculus class, you never do anything with radicals without first rewriting them as fractional exponents. So get used to that little sleight of hand. The other thing that we notice inside of the log is multiplication, x squared times y. We also have another power of 2 sitting right here. And we also have division happening, x squared times y divided by 100. So we have all three different types of arithmetic happening. We have powers, we have multiplication, and we also have division. And so to apply the properties of logs, we just need to take one step lower on the arithmetic layer cake to take that arithmetic from inside the log to outside the log. So a power inside the log becomes a multiple on the outside of the log. So this is 1 half times the base 10 log of, and then I still have the rest of my arithmetic happening on the inside, 
x squared times y and then divided by 100. There we go. And now, again, following the order of operations, this division bar is grouping the x squared y together. Um, and so we need to handle it first. And so this division on the inside of my log becomes subtraction, one step lower on the layer cake on the outside of my log. And so I'm still going to have my 1 half sitting out here in the front. But that 1 half is going to be multiplying a whole bunch of stuff. It's going to be multiplying the log, base 10, of x squared y minus the log of 100. Again, base 10. Here is my x squared. Here is my y. I'm multiplying those together. So division inside turned into subtraction on the outside. Now this multiplication on the inside can turn into addition on the outside. So I'm going to end up here with the log of x squared. I'm going to stop writing the base if that's OK, because uh, I don't want to clutter the screen too much. Uh, and then it's plus the log of y. I still have minus uh, the log base 10 of 100. Uh, all of that is in parentheses. I have a 1 half out in front of everything. Whew. OK. And then the last step is I'm going to take this power of x from the inside and make it, again, a multiple on the outside. So this second power becomes a second multiple instead. I'm just going to do that in place so I don't have to rewrite this whole expression one more time. And then if we want to, and we probably do, uh, let's try to simplify everything that we have here. If I distribute this 1 half, it's going to cancel this 2. It's going to attach to this log of y. It's going to give me minus a half log of 100. So I'm going to get here log of x plus 1 half log of y. And then I'm going to have minus 1 half times the log of 100. And to simplify the log of 100, I'm going to put my base back in here. It's a log base 10. Remember, the log base 10 of 100 is an answer to the question, 10 raised to what power is equal to 100? And a little guess and check will convince you, I hope, that that question mark is filled in by the number 2. So this log base 10 of 100 is really just 2. And a half times 2 is equal to 1. So that explains this rather intricate uh, problem. It explains where this answer ultimately comes from. But then, um, You'll also notice that I slipped an absolute value of x here into the answer key. If you included it, great. Uh, if you didn't, I'm not going to, I'm certainly not going to dock you for it, especially in my standards based grading, where I'm really looking to see did you understand how to apply the properties of logs, even if you slipped up on, a, on a including an absolute value. But I included in the answer key. Um, just to be extra careful here that even when x is a negative quantity, by the time it gets squared inside of my logarithm and its square root is taken, that x is always going to end up being positive anyway. And so we ended up here with a log of a naked x in this way of expressing my final answer, when really the domain of this function would include only non-negative, in fact, only positive values of x, whereas the domain of my original function actually includes all non-zero values of x, because x is getting squared here, and therefore we can take the logarithm anyway, um, even if x were negative. But again, subtle point, technical point, I'm certainly not going to be manning the, the barricades on that one. OK, so uh, with that under our belt, let's take a look at the last of our quizzes for the semester. The last one of our quizzes um, was the one in which we dwelled on how to solve exponential equations. Uh, and then we also um, looked at doing some exponential modeling. So the good news for exponential equations is that some of them, certainly not all of them and not enough of them probably, um, but some of them can be solved very quickly if the base of the exponential on both sides of the equation are equal. So in this example, both sides of my equation are exponentials with a base of 9. And so 
because exponential functions are all one to one, we can guarantee that canceling out by taking a base, base 10 logarithm of 9 is going to give me an equivalent equation uh, that it remains true. And so we end up with x squared minus x minus 6 is equal to 0. That's a quadratic equation. And so when you go to solve that quadratic equation, you find out that it actually ends up having two solutions. Um, the key to this second problem, since the bases are different on both sides, is actually to realize that 27 is a base that's related to 3 in a nice way. It's the third power of 3. And so if I replace 27 by 3 to the third power, it gives me a way of rewriting both sides of my equation to both have a base of 3. After all, 3 to the third raised to the x minus 1, according to the properties of exponents, is the same as 3 raised to the product 3 times x minus 1. And with that key property of exponents, now we can use the same strategy that we used up here. Now that my base is 3 on both sides, I can cross out that base and write x plus 8 is equal to 3 times the quantity x minus 1. And there, that linear equation can be solved to get us the solution that we're looking for. Um, it's when things get a little bit more complicated um, that we might need a little bit more sophistication uh, to solve. Now, the next one of the, the problems here has a, a base of 4 on the left-hand side and a base of 8 on the right-hand side. Um, and neither of those is a power of the other, at least a very nice whole number power of the other. So my suggestion for how to solve this problem is to rewrite both of them as powers of a common base. Write them both as powers of 2. 4 is the second power of 2. 8 is the third power of 2. And if I do it that way, then I'm going to have a nice route to rewriting both sides using that power of 2, and then just eliminating by taking a base 2 log of both sides. That'll give you a linear equation that you can solve to get to your final answer. So sometimes thinking outside the box a little bit, even if we can't write one of these bases as a power of the other that's a whole number, if we can write them both as powers, whole number powers, of a, a single integer, um, then we can be in good shape. All right, let's go forward to the next set of uh, exponential equations to solve. And these ones did get a little bit more hairy. Because here, we had to do some arithmetic first uh, in order to get the exponential by itself. And then once the exponential was by itself, um, we really needed to take a, a logarithm uh, in order to solve for x. So just to step through the arithmetic quickly on this one, before I take any logs, I should get this power 2 to the x by itself. Unwrap it from the arithmetic that surrounds it. That just requires a few steps, subtracting 62 from both sides, and therefore giving me 60 equals 40 times 2 to the x, and then dividing by 40 on both sides. 60 divided by 40 is going to give me 3 halves equals 2 to the x. And now that my 2 to the x is by itself, now is the time when I want to yet again, take my exponential equation and transform it into a logarithmic equation just by reversing the roles of the exponent and the power, right? and therefore changing the exponential function into a logarithmic function. So where I had an x in my exponent, I'm going to bring that x down and make it uh, on the right-hand side. And my 3 halves is going to become the argument for my base 2 logarithm, log base 2 of 3 halves. Now, to finish this problem and get an exact answer, I want to use properties of exponents, rather properties of logarithms. This division that I have inside of my log, I can turn into subtraction that happens on the outside. Log base 2 of 3 minus log base 2 of 2. And the log base 2 of 2, again, thinking about the difference between logarithms and exponentials. If x and y are both, uh, sorry, if b and y here are both 2, and x is my unknown, then what I'm really asking is, 2 raised to what power is equal to 2? And the answer to that is it's 2 to the first power. So log base 2 of 2 is equal to 1. And so this equation is solved by log base 2 of 3 minus 1.
to actually get a decimal approximation for that, we need um, to take a calculator and use the change of base formula. Log base 2 of 3, according to the change of base formula, is the log of 3 divided by the log of 2. And that log can be any base that I like. Log base 10, log base e, pull out a calculator, uh, and however you like to do it is going to give you the same answer. That's the great thing about the change of base formula. And that gets me to a solution. Part B is, again, uh, a little bit hairy. Um, but the best way to do it is just to sort of give up and take a logarithm on both sides. Make your log one of the two bases of your exponential. So I have an exponential with a base of 2 over here, an exponential with a base of e over there. Let's just punt and use the exponential with a base of e uh, to take a logarithm with a base of e on both sides. The issue with that, let me zoom in on this a little bit to make sure that my point's not going to get lost here. When I decide just to sort of punt and take a logarithm on both sides of this equation, I have to have my wits about me, because in order to do this simplification, I'm going to need to use all my properties of logarithms that I know. The natural log of 2 to the power 2x minus 1, or 2x plus 1, rather, is what I have on the left side. Over here, I get the logarithm of 4 times e to the minus x. And before I can simplify this any further, I need to take all the arithmetic that's now happening inside of my logarithms, and I need to move it outside. So this power of 2x plus 1 has to be dealt with. This power of minus x is going to have to be dealt with. And this multiplication, 4 times e to the minus x, that's going to have to be dealt with as well. Multiplication inside of a log becomes addition on the outside using the properties of logarithms. And so I'm going to get, on my right-hand side, the natural log of 4 plus the natural log of e to the minus x. And on my left-hand side, my natural log of 2 to the power 2x plus 1. We can take that power that's happening on the inside and make it a multiple happening on the outside. 2x plus 1 times the natural log of 2. And then the last thing I'm going to do is take this exponent that's happening on the inside of this log and move it to the outside as well. Again, focus on the moral of the story here. The moral of the story is that taking the logarithm of both sides of one of these equations has the effect of rescuing all of the variables x from the exponents back down to Earth, back down to the bases of these expressions. And once they're down in the bases, now, what used to be an exponential equation has become a linear equation to solve for x. And it's linear because despite the fact that we have this ln scary looking thing as part of my equation, the ln is being taken of the number 2. And the ln of 2 is just a number. It's like 0 0.68 or something like that. right? So ln of 2 is just a number. ln of 4 is just a number. ln of e over there is just a number. And so all I have are x's multiplied by numbers and added to other numbers. This is just a linear equation that we can solve for x. Last thing I want to say here um, before I let you fill in the rest of these details is what's the natural log of e? Natural log is the logarithm whose base is the natural number e to begin with. And so this is an answer to the question, what power of e do I need in order to equal e? And that answer is it's the first power of e. So the natural log of e is just another name for the number 1, which is also an invisible multiplication. So this is already looking simpler at this point. Um, and so finishing out the rest of that uh, arithmetic and algebra, you can solve this equation for x uh, to find an exact answer and then get an approximation for that exact answer by using a calculator. And as part of that, because we chose to take a natural logarithm to rescue all of our variables from the exponents, um, we don't have to use the change of base formula to find a decimal approximation for these, because ln of 2 is something your calculator can tell you directly. Finally, uh, let's take a look at a couple of exponential modeling problems. In the first one, um, we have $100 to invest in a get-rich-quick scheme. And the, the goal of this get-rich-quick scheme, evidently, is to uh, double your money over the course of every three years that you've invested this money. So if we invest $100, then three years later, it's going to be worth twice as much, 200 Six years later, it's going to have doubled again from 200 to 400 12 years 
Well, to go from six years to 12 years, we have to go through two spans of three years. And so we're going to double twice from here to there. Uh, 400 doubled once is 800. Doubled again is 1,600. So we very clearly have an exponential function that this behavior is describing. Is every time we add 1 to the number of years, we're multiplying the value of our investment by 2. Or, uh, sorry, every time we add 3, that was a misspeaking on my part. Every time we add 3 to x, we are multiplying y by 2. And so if my y-intercept, the value of my initial investment when x is equal to 0, is 100, how do I find out the value for the base? This is the part that people who, uh, people who dropped the ball in this quiz tended to drop it right here. So let's take a closer look at how I might think about this part b. How do I find the base of this exponential uh, function, given the information that we have here? So x is the number of years since I invested. y is the value of my investment. And we know that in the beginning, the value of my investment is $100. And we know that three years later, the value is supposed to have doubled to 200. And then at year number six, it has to have doubled again to 400. And so the information that we have in the problem gives us a relationship between the changing quantities that says that increasing x by 3, in other words, when we go forward into the future by three years, then the value of my investment is multiplied by 2. But what is the base of an exponential expression? The base answers the question, by what factor does y increase or decrease? When the value of x is increased not by 3, but by only 1. So how do I figure out how to take this change in the x variable by an increase of 3 and cut it apart? so that it becomes three successive changes by one instead. What's going to happen in the y variable when we do that? This is very much kind of like that quiz 10 question where you're first getting introduced to exponential functions. So what I want to do is I want to take and put in a couple of fictitious data points here in the middle. Right? How much am I going to have after one year, after two years, after three years? If I can figure out how to answer those questions, then we'll be in business. And we can figure that out by reminding ourselves that over the course of these three years, what's happened is we've multiplied by 2. We want to know how much are we multiplying by in each one of these successive years. And the answer to that question is going to tell me the base of my exponential function. And the reason that it does is because every adjacent pair of data points here is now separated by plus 1. That's that magic number 1. Every time that x increases by 1, y is going to be multiplied by whatever the base of my exponential equation is. So here's a way that I think resonated with the people who did this question correctly. That if we're looking at this model, v of x is equal to a times b to the x, we know that a is equal to 100 after we did the previous problem. So if v of x is 100, times b to the x. One way of doing this is by um, just taking one of the data points that I know. For example, when x is equal to 3, y, v of x, if you like, is equal to 200. If I take that and I just substitute that data point into my function model template, this is kind of like when you're finding the slope-intercept uh, equation for a line and then using the equation to solve for the intercept. When v of x is equal to 200, x is equal to 3. And now b is the only unknown in this equation, so I can solve for it. How do I do it? I divide both sides by 100 to get 2 is equal to b to the power 3. And then I just need to raise both sides to the 1 -third power. And I find out that b is 2 to the power 1 -third. There we go. It's the cubed root of 2. So what this is telling me is that every time x increases by 1, y is going to increase by a factor of the cubed root of 2, 2 to the power 1 -third. After all, when I multiply by the cubed root of 2 three times in succession, then the total amount I've multiplied by is the cubed root of 2 times the cubed root of 2 times the cubed root of 2. It's the cubed root of 2 cubed. And the cubed root of 2 cubed, by definition, is 2.
and I'm going to stop my hand signs right now. Um, so that 2 to the power 1 third, the cube root of 2, is the base of this exponential expression. That's how much y increases, the factor by which y increases every time x increases by plus 1. The final problem on this asks us to do a little bit more exponential modeling. Um, and the tricky part, I think, on this question was converting from the base intercept form into the exponential with a base of e form. Right? Originally, uh, the growth model here, which is describing the growth of population in Africa, um, uses the base intercept format. And the base here is 634.353. On our graph over here, just to reinforce how this is all working, right? 634.353, that number is the y-intercept of my graph. So if we wanted to interpret what that y-intercept means, this would be the y-value when the x-value is equal to 0. And since my x-value measures the number of years since 1990, that means that in the year 1990, the population of Africa was 634.3 million, according to this model. 634.3 million. And I'm getting that million again from the, whoops, off the top of our screen for a second here. I'm getting that million from the units of my y quantity. So there's an interpretation for our intercept. But let's take a moment and get an interpretation for this base. So in the base intercept formulation, 1.0248, that is the amount by which y is multiplied, 1.0248, whenever x increases by 1, increases by plus 1. Okay. Now, when x increases by plus 1, it means that we are one year further away from 1990. So for every year that passes, the value of y, my population, is getting multiplied by 1.0248. So how we would interpret that base is we would say, that every year, according to this model, sorry, my Apple Pencil is rolling over on me here, every year that passes, the population increases by a factor, increases by a factor of 1.0248. But that paragraph that I just wrote is usually not the way that multiplicative changes are communicated in popular media, in culture, in science, in business, and so forth, right? Typically, we don't say things like increases by a factor of in our everyday vernacular. So instead, what we do is we convert this number here to a percentage. To convert this number into a percentage, uh, what we'll do, as with any conversion into percent, is we'll just move this decimal to the right two places and then throw a percent sign in the front. Right? And so another way to say this is that this population is being multiplied by a factor of 102.48%. But again, that word multiplied is not part of how this typically gets communicated. Typically, what, what I want to do is figure out how much of an increase in population on a percentage basis is this really. And so I'm going to take and subtract out 100% from this to figure out how much the increase actually was. And when I subtract that 100% out, this is how this kind of thing usually reads. Right? Every year that passes, the population is increasing by 2.48%. So that little language of percent growth and percent decrease um, is something that is really a, a major thing in scientific communication, in journalistic communication, in business communication. Anytime we're talking about exponential behavior, we tend to talk about percentage increases and decreases. And then the very last problem here. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't quite finish with this part. So where does this 0 0.0245 come from, and how is it different from this number? It's different because this is not actually a base, but it's a continuous growth rate. This is, if this were an investment you know, that's compounding continuously throughout the year, this would be the continuous interest rate that it would be earning. Right? So the, how we got this number um, is we just took the base that we knew from the base intercept formulation, and we said, well, if that base is equal to e to the something, then what something 
is going to fill in that blank. 1.0248 is e to the something, e to the r. And so to solve this equation for r, I just need to rearrange this exponential equation into a logarithmic equation instead and find out that r is the log with a base of e of 1.0248. And log with a base of e is better known as the natural log. And so I can pull out my calculator without any change of base formula needed to find out that it's approximately 1.024 or 0 0.0245. To finish, um, let's do the work of this um, conversation here, which says, in which year is this exponential model going to predict a population of 2.5 million people in Africa, which I've helpfully reminded you would correspond to 2,500,000, uh, uh, yeah, 25, no, actually, ew. this is actually a typo on my quiz. Sorry about that. When would this predict a population of 2.5 billion, not million? Y equals 2,500, 2,500 million people. So for this, we could use either one of these equation models, but I think it's a little easier to use the exponential with the base of e because we're not going to need to remember any change of base formula in order to do that. So if I want to know what my model tells me, 634.353 times e to the point 0245x, and I know that I want my y value to be 2,500, that means that 2,500 inhabits the left-hand side of this equation. Then the question would just be, what x value do we need? 353e three, three, to the point 0, 0245 times x. If I want to get this x by itself, just like in our previous examples, we need to get this exponential expression by itself first. So we'll divide both sides by 634.353. When I divide both sides by that, get my calculator out here, 2500 divided by 634.353, I get about 3.941. And then I'm doing this example up to this point because now is the reminder that we now is the time to switch the exponential form into a logarithmic form. And when I do that, I'm going to get a logarithm with a base of e, in other words, a natural logarithm of 3.941, is equal to the exponent from my right-hand side, 0.245 times x. And so x is equal to the natural log of 3.941 divided by 0 0.0245. And when we evaluate that in a calculator, we get approximately 55.9 or something like that. right? Um, and so to put that number back into context, just remember that x here is measured in the number of years since 1990. And so having 55.9 years since 1990 is going to correspond for me to the year 2045. And that's going to do it. Um, so that wraps up today's live stream. We're going to do another live stream to look back through the video of review topics one more time, uh, either later on tonight or early tomorrow morning, uh, and that's going to wrap things up for this semester.